Hey guys, it's Ryan. Welcome back. This is part two of our operative dentistry videos. And in the first video, we talked about some principles of tooth preparation, some of the common materials used. But now let's talk about some commonly performed operative procedures. So enamelloplasty is the conservative reshaping of tooth enamel. Now this can involve the removal of pit and fissures to create a smooth saucer-shaped surface that can be more easily cleaned. Now let me get the pen. And so if we were taking like a cross section through a tooth, this could be resembling a pit or a fissure where it's a sharp dive down. And um, this is just a hard area to access, uh, which means it's hard to clean with a toothbrush or even with chewing and saliva, washing this area, it becomes difficult just by the nature of this pit or fissure. It's also difficult to remineralize through buffering agents and easy to de demineralize uh, with acids and bacteria getting trapped and, and hiding out in this area. So the idea is to reshape this to more of a saucer-shaped surface so it's easier to clean and harder for bacteria to get stuck down in there and form plaque that's difficult to remove. But now it also can refer to um, a purely cosmetic change like in this image. So it looks like there's some irregularities on the incisal surfaces of these teeth. So they were um, shaped with a burr of some sort to make all these uh, surfaces more even and more symmetrical. So that's enameloplasty. Purely an enamel, so usually no need for anesthetic here. Now pit and fissure sealants are also uh, a very conservative approach, very commonly performed. Uh, again, these are hard areas to clean, and so instead of removing some enamel, you can opt to etch and flow a sealant material to smooth out these pits and fissures. Um, a pit is basically the failure of uh, fossa to coalesce, whereas fissures are the failure of grooves to coalesce during tooth formation. Now we have preventive resin restorations, sort of like a combination of the previous two. There's basically uh, a primary carious lesion in one spot along a pit or fissure. That lesion is restored first tooth material is removed, and the remaining pits and fissures are protected with a sealant. Um, also, when a definitive caries diagnosis cannot be reached, sometimes the dentist will opt to conservatively explore these suspicious areas with the burr and then fill in with a flowable or sealant material. All right, so let's talk about class one restorations. As in the first video we talked about, basically this refers to, um, and this is sort of um, just the way, the way that they're defined, all the pitted areas. So we're talking about lingual of maxillary incisors and the lingual pit areas, all the occlusal grooves and pits of posterior teeth, and the occlusal two-thirds of the facial surfaces for uh, the mandibular molars in the lingual surfaces of the maxillary molars, where those grooves sort of extend uh, down from the occlusal surface. So the initial prep for a class one composite. So the first thing to do is to establish your long axis. This is orienting the burr through basically the top of the patient's head along um, a parallel line that is uh, along with basically the long axis of the tooth from root to crown. You make your initial punch cut in the most carious pit. So if you're talking between like a mesial or a distal pit, you would start where the caries are most severe. If it's a tie, you can start distally and go mesial. That way you get the best visibility. You're kind of moving towards yourself instead of moving further away. Uh, now the rule is to cut 0.2 millimeters inside the DEJ. This is basically just 
right inside as you're going through enamel, you get right into the dentin layer. And that's because um, when bacteria penetrate and leave their byproducts and cause tooth decay, uh, the spread is much quicker at the DEJ just by the nature of that tissue being less mineralized than the enamel. So you want to get inside the D just right inside this junction here in order to um, better explore that area as we uh, expand this prep. And that's the next step is to extend the external wall. So after you make this initial punch cut, you extend laterally in all directions without going deeper. Um, we can talk more about that part later, but for this uh, step of our initial prep, you want to extend laterally until you reach sound tooth structure, aka the bounds of the disease. Uh, the pulpal floor will generally follow the rise and fall of the DEJ um, area, and the final prep deals with deeper caries removal. So basically the idea here is to expand your window so you can see what you're doing before you go deeper towards the pulp. Now the pulpal depth of your prep at this point will be somewhere between one half and two thirds the length of a 245 burr, if that's what you're choosing to use. Um, and you want to extend your prep around the cusps if possible uh, to avoid the pulp horns and to avoid weakening tooth structure more than you have to. The isthmus refers to the facial lingual extension of the preparation design. Ideally, it should be no more than one millimeters, which is about a quarter intercuspal distance. This is so, um, again, you don't uh, reduce the strength of the tooth. But as with everything we talk about here, you have to take it with a little grain of salt because the preparation is ultimately determined by the bounds of the disease. Um, convergent walls. This is uh, more theoretical than anything, I think, but it's to protect the adhesive interface. We'll talk, talk more about bonding a little bit later. It's not technically retentive for a composite because it is being bonded to two structure. This becomes a bigger player with amalgam, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Resistance form refers to the pulpal floor being perpendicular to occlusal forces. So as in this image, the you can see the pulpal floor isn't all jaggedy and uh, super sloped. It's, um, parallel, it's perpendicular to um, the biting forces from the opposing arch, and that's so that it can um, resist those biting forces as best as possible rounded internal line angles, because anything that's a sharp internal line angle will concentr concentrate stress and you have a greater risk of fracture. So that's just a general rule you should always keep in mind for pretty much anything that you do in operative um, or pros or anything like that. And then, you, as we talked about in our first video, you don't want uh, unsupported enamel and how you, do, how you um, ensure that as best we can is that the, the angle formed between the cavity wall and the external surface of the tooth is greater than 90 degrees. If it's less than 90 degrees, you have that risk of having unsupported enamel that may fracture and then compromise the integrity of all our hard work later on. Um, and like we said, Retention form is sort of unnecessary because of adhesive dentistry. We don't really need to rely on mechanical retention. So the marginal ridge of the tooth is incredibly important to its strength. This has been proven over and over. So basically, just try to um, maintain the integrity of the marginal ridge. 1.6 millimeters is, a, a, I guess, a good template to stick to. Now for deep caries removal. After that initial prep, say we realize, oh no, the caries are, are extending deeper. There's still a ton of uh, soft tooth structure deeper in. What do we do? The best thing to use in most cases, I think, is 
this larger burr slow speed. So the pretty much the largest burr that you can fit in that area safely in a slow speed handpiece is is great because you have careful control as opposed to piercing through with a smaller burr and a high speed handpiece or even compared to a hand instrument which can be deceivingly dangerous because it can be like if it's an explorer or something you can pierce right through a couple millimeters without even knowing but a large burr and a slow speed taking up a lot of surface area you can generally um, spin that without applying too much force and it'll slowly and slowly remove away the infected dentin layer which pointed to here in this image would be number five uh, number four uh, refers to uh, the leathery dentin layer which is also kind of soft and then after we get to about three and two this is sort of the harder dentin layers that we want to leave intact Alright, so for restoration, um, we use our etching first, um, about for 15-30 seconds. You want to fill in the preparation and go a little bit over the cavo surface margin. This is to ensure that everything is being etched, you're being very thorough. Um, it removes the smear layer from uh, your preparation. Uh, it's basically, I call a sawdust of uh, two structure that remains after your uh, drilling and the etch selectively removes the uh, ends of the enamel rods and selectively removes the mineral of dentin to expose the collagen fibrils. So the etch is most effective on enamel um, and then after doing this you want to thoroughly rinse for 10 seconds which feels like an eternity but you want to make sure you get all that off and then you want to dry off the excess water, but the tendency is to want to dry everything off really well, and that's not what you want to do. You want to keep it moist, not bone dry, and not dripping wet, somewhere in the middle. Um, and then we use our, uh, if you're using a fifth generation material, which is basically a one bottle system, it combines the primer and the adhesive, you would apply this with like a little micro brush kind of thing. Um, you could gently air dry it to evaporate the solvent, thin out the adhesive layer, and then you can reapply it to be very thorough, make sure you're infiltrating all those exposed collagen fibrils of the dentin, and then light cure it for 10 seconds. As we talked about uh, before with the composite, you hold it basically as close as you can without um, touching uh, that material so as to not compromise the tip of the light carrying unit and then you want to be um, ready to go with that. Now with the composite material there are a ton of systems you can pick from this is just uh, one system of many that you can use and you want to shape everything as best as possible before curing so there's as minimal finishing and polishing necessary later. Um, along with those lines, you don't want to mess around too much with the composite because the more you tend to play around with it, the more chance you have of introducing voids and imperfections. So try to stick with big sweeping motions and get that thing figured out as as you know as efficiently as you can. So you're not um, playing around with it and get a whole bunch of air bubbles later. Um, and you can also lubricate the instrument tip with adhesive and use smaller increments and light cure those at a time instead of light carrying a huge bulk of material because it might not penetrate through all the way you'll get a lot more shrinkage so using smaller increments uh, can be helpful and then of course there's always some finishing and polishing necessary at the end so you can use these multi-fluted um, burrs in a handpiece and then you can use some polishing tips here's some jiffy points um, or these enhanced points are really nice. They're made of a composite material, so um, they're basically similar to the material that you use to fill the tooth and therefore very good polishers. All right, so now for amalgam, we want to be aware of a few different things. 
Number one, we want to maintain enough bulk. With proper thickness, amalgam is a very strong material and good for the posterior region, but if it's too thin, it's prone to fracture. So instead of a cavo surface margin being greater than 90 degrees, now we want it as close to 90 degrees as possible to allow the enamel to be supported, but also for the amalgam to be 90 degrees so it's sturdy at the edges. Now retention, like I mentioned before, is important for amalgam because we can't bond amalgam to tooth structure. So we need to mechanically lock it in place. And um, to do that, we use something called occlusal convergence. So if this is our prep design. This is the occlusal and this is deeper in and I just broke one of my <laughs> one of the rules I was stressing before. We want in, uh, rounded internal line angles. Sorry about that. And then here is our uh, rough surface of the tooth and so hopefully you get the idea here is that the occlusal um, aspect of the prep is more narrow than the pulpal portion so that you can, um, you know, figure if you uh, compress the amalgam in here, it sort of gets locked into place once it sets and it can't really um, get displaced outwards that way. Now you also have, um, you can add in secondary retention, which would be like smaller retention grooves that you place in the internal part of your prep to, again, help lock it in place. So amalgam is a conducting metal and it takes a while to seal, so desensitizing the pulp is essential, especially if your preparation was pretty deep into dentin. Um, one of the things you can use is a gluma, and I have it pictured here. Um, basically rub it into the preparation with a micro brush for um, about a minute and then you can rinse it off afterwards. And this helps to um, plug up the dentinal tubules to uh, eliminate some of this um, post-operative sensitivity that a patient can experience. So uh, some more considerations for class 1 amalgam. Um, you want to make a mental image of the outline form that you prepared first so you can kind of figure out what's my filling supposed to look like when we're all done here. Where were the original edges of the tooth structure? You want to purposely overfill by about a millimeter or more. Um, this eliminates excess mercury and if, uh, of course mercury is in such trace amounts that it's no concern but this is uh, not a bad thing. And to ensure that the margins are completely covered because the last thing you want is when the amalgam finally sets if it turns out you didn't pack enough in and you have this big gap um, or a big discrepancy between tooth and amalgam, that can be um, difficult to fix later on without having to redo part of it. You want to condense the amalgam really, really well. This prevents voids and marginal leakage. Um, you want to carve to, again, to the margins of your outline form. Um, and you can use like a discoid cleoid instrument, rest on adjacent unprepared enamel, and then um, you can slowly scrape away um, the material until it matches where the tooth um, is. And then you want to, if you want to carve in primary anatomy, like in this picture, that's great. Um, but deep grooves and sort of secondary accessory grooves are, are not recommended because that might unnecessarily thin the amalgam material and invite chipping and fracture. So it's really not necessary for, for uh, benefit to the patient. Um, I mentioned a little bit about post-op sensitivity. So I just wanted to mention three really important post-op instructions for both composite and amalgam fillings to tell your patient after you finish. So number one, um, tell the patient to chew on the other side or avoid that tooth until at least tomorrow. Um, for amalgam, you want to make sure the material sets fully before they're applying a lot of force to it. 
and um, composite, just it's in good practice to avoid that spot if possible. Number two, tell the patient they should expect to feel numb for the next few hours, um, I'm assuming using anesthetic, um, due to the anesthetic not wearing off for a few hours. Um, so tell them not to bite their lip or their cheek if they can help it. And number three, tell them they should expect to feel sore for the next uh, little while, especially if it was a deeper filling. So instruct them to take over-the-counter pain relievers um, as indicated and as needed for pain. All right, and then this this is just another type of class one amalgam, uh, an occlusal lingual, um, and sometimes it can be difficult to um, prevent the landsliding of amalgam because you're condensing it in. But anyway, we can skip through this. So uh, let's keep going here, and we talked about class one restorations. Now, class two restorations are. Um, basically incorporating the proximal surfaces of posterior teeth. So now we're not only talking about the occlusal surface, these fillings are also involving the mesial or distal or both surfaces. So potential problems with class two um, with composite. So if you have a deep preparation, now imagine it's kind of on a, a mesial or a distal surface of the tooth and it's going down below the gum line even, that can be really hard to isolate, which is critical to composite. We don't want saliva, we don't want blood to infiltrate this area. It'll make it um, very hard to cure and introduce voids, create a whole bunch of problems. So that's something we need to consider. Um, it's also just technically hard to reach with your curing light and um, the gingival wall can eventually run out of enamel. If you imagine we go deep and deep and deep, we might just end up with uh, dentin at the bottom. So that bonding is not as predictable. Remember the etching is not as um, effective with dentin as it is with enamel. And just in uh, basic principle, in extensive prep, you have more surface area. Um, these occlusally loaded areas can experience wear and packing composite, like we mentioned before, can result in voids if you play around with it uh, a lot. So the initial prep for class two composite, as, composed to, as uh, opposed to class one, is similar, but of course you extend the prep to one or both sides of the tooth, which I'll show you in the next slide. So this is basically our, the body of our prep, and then you see this new kind of area called the proximal box. And you notice that that's a little bit deeper than the rest of the, the prep design. Um, and so some things also to consider is the reverse S. And that is basically referring to this part right here. So if we trace the wall, it sort of makes an S here and sort of makes an S here. And that's a great preparation design, useful for extensive preparations like these because it conserves the cusp. And you know, instead of going something like this, where we're cutting through some uh, and removing just excess tooth material that we don't have to, and it allows us to have a 90 degree cavo surface margin. We can see right here between the cavity wall here and the external surface of the tooth here. Again, same thing here. So it's pretty darn close to 90 degrees. Whereas if we just made a, a B line for the outside of the tooth, we might not be getting you know a perfect 90 degree angle. We might be making an acute angle, and then we're um, compromising tooth structure. So reverse S is always a nice design to keep in mind for these class twos. Um, and then clearance refers to um, basically is measured as the distance between the cavo surface margin and the adjacent tooth. So it would be, if I get a different color here, it'd basically be the spaces here, right there, and right there. 
So we shoot for about 0.25 to 0.5. Again, depends on the extent of your preparation, the extent of your disease, um, but that's just one of those um, things to those numbers to keep in mind. And then hand instruments um, like the enamel hatchet or the gingival margin trimmer are almost usually necessary in order to remove all the little enamel spicules and spurs left by the burr. And maybe I can make a video about different operative instruments in the future. You just, just let me know. So now that we cleared out a sidewall of tooth, how do we restore it to proper contour? Well, we use a matrix and a wedge. So the matrix is basically um, a band of some material. In this case, the Toffelmeyer band is uh, metal, and we can bend it around the side of the tooth to form a template for a restorative material to shape up against. This is the uh, holder here. Um, it's sort of a pain in the butt to use, but it holds the band in place. Um, and then we would place um, a wedge, which goes in between that tooth that you're working on and the adjacent tooth. And this is to ever so slightly move the two teeth apart as much as the periodontal ligaments will allow so that when we remove the matrix and the wedge at the end, there's not an open space left where the matrix band was. Um, as a general rule of thumb, you should use one wedge um, if the matrix band passes through one contact, and so for like an MO or a DO, and use two wedges if the band passes through two two surfaces, so that if you're doing an MOD. Um, and this thing here, it looks a lot different. Uh, that's part of the sectional matrix system, and that can be used for composites. And instead of using uh, the metal bands, you use clear plastic strips, and you can use this ring to hold everything in place. So there are a lot of different methods to, to this madness. Um, and then for composites that go to a proximal surface, make sure not only to cure from the occlusal, but also cure from the facial and the lingual, as shown in these pictures. And then you can use, uh, since you can't always reach with those burrs and those um, polishing points that I showed you before, you can use things that are a little bit more slender that can fit through to the that area. Now what about amalgam? There are a couple of things that we need to keep keep in mind here. Again, occlusal convergence helps prevent displacement occlusally, but now we also need to use um, something called dovetailing, which is this area right here where it kind of bends out um, in one direction, and this is to help prevent displacement to the side out this direction. Um, and this, this slide is just saying that you need to have um, a rigid matrix band so that it can hold its form, and an essential sequence in this whole process is to put the matrix band on and then um, burnish it against the adjacent tooth so that it has a, a nice contour. All right, and then the very last thing I wanted to mention um, was pulpal protection. So there are a whole lot of things that can irritate the pulp, um, air, temperature, um, other things, and especially if we're within like 0.5 to 1 millimeters of the pulp, we need to protect it. Um, and so rapid dental fluid movement is currently uh, the understood theory for why a tooth may hurt during uh, processes like thermal conduction, electrical conduction. So we want to um, block these tubules. We can use like a Gluma desensitizer, like we mentioned before, which basically plugs these tubules so you're not getting that rapid uh, dental fluid movement. And then we also have uh, things like liners and bases that can help protect the pulp. Um, calcium hydroxide stimulates the pulp to lay down new dentin. So this is our material choice if we are very close to the pulp, but it dissolves easily in oral solution. So we cover it with a resin-modified glass ionomer base, which seals very well to dentin, 
um, and then protects that calcium hydroxide layer. And then we cover this with our amalgam or our composite. Alright guys, well, sorry for the long video. That's all I got uh, for this one. Thanks so much for watching. Um, as always, leave a like, share this video, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already for more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.